for the kind invitation uh, and also for organizing this wonderful uh, seminar series. Uh, I'm glad to, um, to see all, all of you online. Um, so today I'm going to discuss some results on aggregation diffusion equation uh, and in particular that I will focus on the property of steady states. Um, so uh, my talk will be based on two works. Uh, the first one is a joint work with Jose Carrillo, Sabine Hidmeyer, and Bruno Volzone, uh, and the more recent one with Matias Delgadino and Xu Kaiye. So uh, to begin with, uh, let me introduce the Keller-Siegel equation, uh, which is uh, within the class of the uh, aggregation diffusion equation. Uh, this one is the most well studied uh, and it has been there for almost half a century. Um, so the Keller-Siegel equation models the collective motion of cells. Uh, the, so the movement of the cells is as follows. Uh, the population density of the uh, certain bacteria or slime mold is given by this function rho, uh, which is the function of x and t. Uh, and traditionally, um, the, the bacteria are living in a petri dish, therefore um, this equation is initially set up in 2D. And the evolution of the density satisfies this nonlinear and non-local equation. Uh, and to begin with, I would like to do a short derivation to show you how this equation is derived because the first time I saw it, I was quite confused on like where the second um, non-local term come out. Um, so uh, this equation is actually derived from the following system. Here, uh, the first equation says the following, that on the one hand, that's the bacteria are just doing Brownian motion. And if this is the yeah. only thing that they are doing, uh, this would be the, they would, the population density would satisfy the heat equation. Um, but in addition to doing brown emotion, uh, it is also attracted by some kind of chemical C. So at any moment, it has this extra drift velocity field that is going into the direction where C is increasing the fastest, and therefore this extra drift term. And uh, if the chemical concentration C is some, something that is given a priori, then this would be still a linear equation in rho, which is called the Foucault-Planck equation. Um, however, the interesting thing is that uh, the chemical density C is not a, a priori given function, but rather that it is related to rho in the following way. Um, so let's look at this orange text for now and ignore all the green text. Uh, and it says that on the one hand that C is diffusing, and on the other hand, that the thing that link the two of them together is that the chemical that the bacteria love so much are actually produced by themselves. So if we just look at the orange text, then this is the system of two parabolic equations, and this is called the parabolic parabolic Keller-Siegel equation. Uh, well, this equation doesn't quite look like the first um, single nonlinear equation. So their connection is as follows, that um, the two parabolic equation doesn't quite happen at the same time scale, namely that uh, the bacteria themselves actually move rather slow uh, while the chemical reach its equilibrium much faster. So in that sense, it is traditional to multiply a small constant epsilon in front of the chemical density to indicate that um, the chemical reach its equilibrium at a much faster time. And uh, to simplify things, one can even just send epsilon all the way to zero, indicating that um, at each moment, once we have the bacteria density at that moment, we immediately know the chemical reach its equilibrium corresponding to that density. So then the second equation becomes the elliptic equation, and this system is now called the parabolic elliptic Keller-Siegel equation. And we know that um, this elliptic equation has a very simple solution where we can recover C as the negative Newtonian potential convolved with rho, and finally plugging it into the first equation exactly give us the non-local and non-linear system. Um, so that is how the Keller-Siegel equation is defined, and that explains where this Newtonian potential comes out. Um, and math-wise, uh, people find this equation very interesting because it demonstrates this critical mass phenomena. 
Um, so namely that if we look at these two terms, then they have two competing effects. The diffusion tends to make things smoother, while the second term here is basically saying that uh, for each pair of bacteria, they have this uh, velocity field that is, um, that is the pairwise attractive velocity field. And finally, the, the final velocity field is given by like integrating over the density. Um, but anyway, the second term says that there is this pairwise attraction between each pair of the bacterium. Um, and so these two terms have a have an oppositing effect. Um, and uh, it turns out that um, the whether uh, this equation has what global well postness or not depends on the mass of this equation. Um, here, mass just means the integral of rho, which is the conserved quantity during the evolution. And uh, since the 1990s, there has been studies on whether this equation will blow up or whether it is globally well posed. Um, and the results are that if the mass is bigger than this critical mass 8 pi, then all the solutions with initially compact support must have a finite time blow up. And if the mass is less than 8 pi, um, then uh, all the solution will remain globally bounded in time. Uh, and as time goes to infinity, they will dissipate um, and the density will go to zero according to the heat equation scaling. Uh, and if we are exactly at the critical mass, um, then there won't be a blow up, but there could be an uh, infinite time aggregation. So uh, that is a story about the Keller-Siegel equation. And today I'm going to talk about a more general version of it, uh, which you can see that it still resembles that equation in the sense that uh, we still have two competing effects here. Uh, but the first term, instead of the linear diffusion, uh, we are considering a nonlinear diffusion where we raise rho to the power m and then take the Laplacian. Uh, throughout my talk, I'm going to assume that m is bigger than or equal to 1. And biologically speaking, um, this models the anti-overcrowding effect, which means that um, the bacteria themselves are not just doing Brownian motion, but they have a tendency to get not too crowded. Um, to see this, we can see that, um, well, if we think about M as a, something that is bigger than one, then if rho is trying to concentrate um, and the density is trying to get very high somewhere, then a bigger M will have a stronger tendency to press down the density and make it remain regular. Um, and um, so this is the, this is still, but this is still a local um, repulsion term. And um, as for this non-local term, uh, instead of Newtonian potential, we can also think about other type of aggregation, uh, the interaction potentials, depending on the application. Um, and throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that the interaction potential W is an attractive interaction potential, uh, which means that I'm going to assume that W is radially symmetric. And uh, the important assumption is that W is increasing in its radial direction, which means that um, between every pair of particles, they still have the tendency to be attracted to each other. And if this is changed to decreasing, then this, they will be uh, repulsive instead. Um, and also that instead of just setting the equation in R2, we can also consider it in the general dimension Rd. So um, a natural question is that, well, what about the well postness versus blow up for this equation? Um, this question has been quite well studied by now, uh, namely that whenever we are given this interaction potential W and whenever we know how singular it is near the origin, then there will be a critical power M um, such that if the power M is above the critical threshold, then there's always global well postness. Um, and below this can, could lead to a finite time blow up. So for example, um, if W is the Newtonian potential in RD, um, then the, the threshold for the power M would be 2 minus 2 over D, uh, where above this power will lead to global well postness and actually a uniform uh, L infinity density in rho, um, but below this may lead to a blow up. 
and notice that this is consistent with what we saw on the last slide uh, because um, if we are in R2, then the critical power M is exactly equal to one, which means that um, the Keller-Siegel equation with linear diffusion is exactly in the case at the, um, where the diffusion exactly has the, the power at the threshold. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, what is your mean uh, uh, where bonus, local where bonus? As solution is smooth on time? Um, uh, so, uh, well, uh, it depends. That's a very good question. Um, so, well, postness, uh, we usually mean that in the weak sense. Um, I want to point out that if we are back in the case of Keller-Siegel equation, um, then the solution is indeed smooth as long as it doesn't blow up because there is this diffusion term. Uh, but here, uh, when we have this uh, degenerate diffusion term, then even if we don't have the aggregation term, then this equation is called porous medium equation, uh, where for m bigger than one, uh, in general, there is no smooth solution. So the, um, um, so there's actually finite speed of propagation and the solution will only remain holder continuous. So by global existence, yeah, so I, I mean, weak sense. Um, um, okay, so that's the well postness story. Um, so throughout all my talk, I'm going to only focus on the case where the well postness is known. So that is not a question. Um, however, even in this, these cases, um, the long time behavior of solution remain unclear. And that is the thing that I'm going to focus on. So uh, let me first point out a very important tool for studying this equation, uh, which is the associated energy structure. So uh, this free energy functional plays a very important role in the studying of this equation. Uh, for now, we can see that, well, it consists of two terms and one can guess that the first term is related to the nonlinear diffusion term and the second term is probably related to the interaction term. Um, so the connection between this energy and the equation is as follows. Um, so if we really want to write down the previous equation as one single transport equation, then its velocity field will be given by um, this green thing here. Uh, and this thing here is exactly the first variation of the energy. Okay. So then using this structure here, um, if we just formally take the time derivative uh, of this energy along a solution, then a very straightforward computation will give us that um, the time derivative is given by negative of this integral and notice that this integral is always non-negative uh, which means that um, along a solution, we always have that the energy is non-increasing. Of course, this is a very formal computation, uh, but it has been shown that uh, the weak solutions do satisfy this property. So it means that this functional is a Lyapunov functional of the evolution, uh, but actually it is more than that. So uh, in addition to being a Lyapunov functional, we actually have that, uh, formally speaking, the solution is a gradient flow of this energy functional, which means that at each moment, um, the, the solution row is going in the steepest descent in the direction where E decreases the fastest. Of course, whenever we say the steepest descent, one has to clarify, well, what is the underlying metric space that we are using? Uh, and here the metric space is the one that is end out by two Wasserstein distance. Um, so this is now um, can be seen in the, in, the, in the very nice books by Villani and Ambrosio Gigli and Savari. Um, however, I want to point out that um, if we want to rigorously justify the, this gradient flow structure, then that will require the interaction potential W to have certain convexity properties. Um, so namely in these books, um, the normal assumption that people make is that W is lambda convex, meaning that it is semi-convex and that would be enough. Um, and recently Katie Craig uh, generalized it to um, the energy being omega convex, which is slightly weaker. Um, but still that in general, if W is 
a Newtonian potential or if it's a Reed's potential that is even more singular than this, um, then there is still um, no gradient flow, uh, rigorous gradient flow formulation. Um, okay, so um, the, the main questions that we want to study is that, well, eventually we would try to understand the long time dynamics in the regime where we have global well postness. And in order to approach this final question, we would like to ask ourselves the intermediate questions in the following order. Um, the first question is that, uh, well, in order to understand the long time behavior, probably the first step is to understand what are the steady states. So one can ask that for a given mass, does there exist a steady state at all? And then if the answer is yes, we can further ask that, um, what can we say about these steady states? Are they necessarily radially symmetric? If yes, are they unique within the radial class? And then if we are so lucky that the answer to these questions are all yes, then we can finally ask that, are they global attractors for the dynamics or not? So these are the order that we are going to approach this question. Um, and uh, for the first question regarding the existence of steady state, uh, it already have a very satisfactory answer. And let me just review the literature below. Um, because of the previous energy structure, uh, one can think that, well, if we want to have a um, steady state, then a natural idea is to say that, well, for a given mass, what about we look for the global minimizer of this free energy with that mass? Um, and then such global minimizer will automatically be a steady state because you're already sitting at the very low uh, point of the energy and then you cannot slide down anywhere else. So that has to be a steady state. Um, and um, so basically existence of steady states can be boiled down to looking for global minimizer of that energy functional. Um, and um, so this has been mostly done by Leons uh, using the concentration compactness argument that he showed that um, his original argument deals with the Newtonian potential. Um, and by the way, so he approached this question not because of its math bio, uh, biology applications, um, but because that this energy functional also arise in the study of the formation of stars. Um, so that's how he studied this functional. And of course, um, for formation of stars, the reasonable interaction energy to use is the Newtonian potential because they are, um, that's the gravitational potential. Um, so his original work deals with the Newtonian potential, but really the argument could be generalized to all the power law kernels um, that using the concentration compactness argument, um, he can show that um, this energy has a global minimizer whenever the power m is bigger than this critical number here. Um, notice that this number is exactly the critical thresholds that separates the global well postness versus blow up. Um, so if M is less than this, then it turns out there's no global minimizer because the energy functional is unbounded below uh, if we let the, uh, the density to be closer and closer to a delta function. Um, but whenever it is above that, then there exists a global minimizer using the concentration compactness argument. Um, and uh, more recently, Bedrosian shows that uh, for any M that is bigger than two and for any attractive potential, um, there exists a global minimizer. So, uh, and for M that is between one and two, a more detailed criteria of existence versus non-existence are given by Carrillo, Delgadino, and Patakini. So um, these are the answer to the first question that under what condition do there exist a steady state? Um, and the next question is that, well, what can we say about the symmetry, right? If the steady state is not even symmetric up to a translation, then one would certainly not expecting any uniqueness result of it. Um, so one thing that I would like to point out is that, uh, it's a straightforward application of the Reed's rearrangement inequality that any global minimizer of the energy has to be radially decreasing. So uh, the reason is that if we look at the two terms of the energy, uh, the first term is just the LM norm of rho. Um, so uh, if we are 
cutting the density row as, it's, as if it is a layered cake and then symmetrize each layer into the center, then uh, the entropy term will remain the same, but the Reeves rearrangement inequality says that the interaction energy would decrease because W is the radially, uh, uh, is a radially increasing potential. So that's a straightforward argument showing that the global minimizer has to be radially decreasing. Um, however, notice that uh, we would like to study what happens for all the steady states. And a priori, of course, we don't know whether the global minimizer is the unique one, right? Maybe there are some other steady states that are only local minimizer or only uh, settle points. And for these steady states, we cannot, the, the Reeves rearrangement inequality doesn't give us anything. So our question is that, well, what happens to all the steady states? Do they have to be all radially symmetric up to a translation? And here, um, so just to write down the equation that the steady state satisfies, it satisfies this non-local equation here, uh, where this constant is uh, the same constant in each of the connected component of the support, uh, but a priori, we don't assume anything about the support, so a priori there could be more than one support, uh, con connected components, and in this case the constant doesn't need to be the same. So that is the equation for the steady states. Um, and for all the attractive potentials that are no more singular than Newtonian potential, um, together with Jose, Carrillo, Sabine Hitmeyer, and Bruno Bolzone, uh, we give a positive answer that uh, all the steady states actually has to be radially decreasing uh, up to a translation. And here, um, our assumption that no more singular than Newtonian kernel is only a technical assumption and it has been removed in some later works. Um, so uh, let me briefly outline the, the idea of the proof. Um, so the idea is that let's assume that we have a non-radial steady state rho s. And um, so since rho s is non-radial, it means that uh, we are able to find some hyperplane that are cutting the mass of rho s into half and half, uh, but rho s is not symmetric decreasing about the hyperplane, right? It means either when you reflect it, they don't match or they match each other, but they are not decreasing as you are going away from the hyperplane. So then uh, we are, the, our idea is that well, because we don't assume rho s to be a global minimizer, right? All we have is this, that it is a steady state. Um, so we are going to find a local perturbation of rho s such that the energy functional is decreasing to the first order under this perturbation. So um, the perturbation that we use is called continuous Steiner symmetrization. And let me describe the procedure to you. Um, so uh, for this density rho s, uh, I'm drawing a one dimensional picture here, but our proof works for all dimensions. So now this vertical line is the hyperplane that I have found. Uh, let's decompose the graph uh, under rho s uh, as the, uh, an infinite collection of these one dimensional little needles that are all perpendicular to the hyperplane. So these horizontal lines are my needles. And for each needle, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's just put a red mark at its center. Um, and because we know that rho s is assumed to be not symmetric decreasing about the hyperplane, uh, it means that we know that some of the center are to the left of the hyperplane and some of the center are to the right of the hyperplane. And then we are going to run the following procedure to make it slightly more symmetrized about the hyperplane uh, in the sense that if initially the red dot is to the left, then we will keep the height of the needle and move it towards the hyperplane with speed one and then vice versa. Of course, we have to treat the case that like if two needles meet each other, the, um, then at this moment, we immediately merge them into one needle and then lo locate its center point and so on. So um, this is just a visualization of um, this blue curve is what rho s becomes after we run this procedure for a short time epsilon. So uh, it's becoming a little bit more symmetrized about um, the vertical line here. 
Okay, um, so um, now with this procedure, because all the distribution function of rho s are keep the same, uh, it means that it doesn't change the Lm norm, right? Um, and but as for the interaction energy, it will actually decrease under this perturbation. Um, so, by the way, um, the continuous Steiner symmetrization is not our invention. Uh, it's actually well known in the symmetrization community, and I learned it from the textbook by Lieb and Laws on analysis. Um, and in that textbook, it is already shown that um, the interaction energy will be not increasing under this um, continuous Steiner symmetrization. Um, but here, we really have to do some messy work to show that it not only decreases along the perturbation, but it's actually decreased in the first order uh, for, of epsilon for a short time. And then, uh, so, um, so this is basically, we say that the energy is decreasing to the first order for a short time. And so where is the contradiction? Well, for now, let's assume that we have a rigorous gradient flow structure. And if this is the case, it means that any steady state rho s should be a critical point of the energy. Um, but on the other hand, um, so, uh, but being critical point means that no matter how we perturb it, we shouldn't have that the energy is dropping to the first order, right? So this violates the point of being a critical point. Therefore, if we have a rigorous gradient flow formulation, then we will immediately get to a contradiction that, well, such a role as cannot be a critical point, and then we are done. Um, so our, our actual proof is a lot more technical than that um, because we, um, so we are, we would like to cover the potential W that do not have these lambda convexity, which means that our equation will not have a rigorous gradient flow formulation. So uh, in our actual proof, um, it is a lot longer than the procedure that I described to you here. Um, so we actually have to modify this perturbation to slow down the velocity at low density um, to be able to manually derive a contradiction for those um, cases where we don't have a rigorous gradient flow formulation. But I would prefer to not go to these technical details and just to show you this is like the key idea of the proof. Um, so that is the proof of the radio symmetry result. And uh, recall that we were working under the assumption that the potential W is attractive, which means that it is a radially increasing potential. Um, here, I just want to mention that uh, this is indeed, an, uh, um, so if we remove that condition, then uh, we indeed will not expect any um, symmetry result. So for example, that um, it is also of um, a lot of interest to study these potentials that are attractive, repulsive. Um, so these are the potentials where the particles are repulsive when they are too close to each other and attractive when they are far away from each other. For example, uh, the Leonard-Jones potential for the molecules. And for these potentials, uh, I'm stealing this nice picture from a work by Kolokonikov, Sun, Uminsky, and Bertozzi, uh, where they consider a family of these re attractive repulsive potentials with two parameters, A and B. And for each A and each B, they run a numeric sim simulation. And then uh, the picture here is shown uh, is the, uh, the steady states for the simulation. And then as you can see that, um, so many of them are clearly not radially decreasing. And actually many of them have this pattern formation. It's, it's not uh, even radially symmetric, right? So it means that um, in order to get the radio symmetry result, uh, we really have to work under the assumption that um, the repulsion is modeled by the local diffusion term, and then the attraction is modeled by the long range non-local attraction. And then if we are um, changing to also the non-local repulsion, then in general, we shouldn't expect any symmetry. Um, okay, so now let me move on to the next question. Um, after we get the satisfactory answer of the symmetry of steady states, the next natural question is that, okay, now what about if we are focusing on these steady states that are radially symmetric? Uh, we know they belong to this class. 
but for a given mass, um, is there a uniqueness within the radially symmetric class? So um, let me review some literature that, um, to our best knowledge, the uniqueness results are only known in the following cases. Uh, so first, for the special case of the Newtonian potential, uh, it has been well known by the result of Lieb and Yao uh, in 1987. So they, again, they also approach this question because the, um, because the, the, the equation can be seen uh, are related to the star formation. So they show that uh, among all the radially symmetric steady states, um, they are unique for each mass, as long as we are in this diffusion-dominated regime where solutions don't blow up. And um, together with my advisor, in Wan Kim, uh, we generalized to Newtonian potential convolved with some potential that is radially decreasing. Uh, and more recently, in these two works by Carrillo, Hoffman, Manini, Volzone, and also Calves, Carrillo, and Hoffman, um, they were able to obtain uniqueness for all the attractive Ries potential, as long as we are in this regime where the, solu the solution doesn't blow up. Um, but in all these results, uh, the, so the homogeneity of Ries potential and Newtonian potentials plays an important role. And to our best knowledge, the only results that can deal with um, something that is not related to a power law potential is the last work here, uh, where these two works by Berger, De Francesco, and Fernac and Kype, um, they deal with the very special power m equal to 2. Um, this power is special because um, in that case, both the diffusion term and the aggregation term are quadratic functions of rho, and their, their proof strongly rely on that. Um, and under this assumption, and also that W is pretty smooth near the origin, um, they first, the first result proved it in 1D, and Kype generalized it into um, general dimensions that um, there is uniqueness among the radially symmetric class. Um, however, for general power M and potential with the singularity near the origin, so far there's no uniqueness results. Um, so together with Matthias and Shikai, uh, we proved that, well, it turns out two is indeed a threshold separating uniqueness versus non-uniqueness. We first prove a uniqueness result for M bigger than two. Um, so we can work with uh, pretty singular potentials. All we need is just it's locally integrable. So it covers all the locally integrable Ries potentials. And then we show that for any given mass, there is at most one steady state in L1 and L infinity. So um, our idea of proof is as follows. And to make things simpler, I'm going to assume that there is the rigorous gradient flow structure to make the proof easier. Um, our actual proof is more technical when there is no rigorous gradient flow structure, but the, the, the very key idea is more or less the same. So um, towards a contradiction, let's say that suppose we have two steady states with the same mass, and uh, we, our goal is that we want to con construct a curve that is connecting them such that the energy functional along this curve is strictly convex. And of course, I haven't described you to you at all how that is doable or whether this curve exists at all, but suppose this is doable, then it is an immediate uh, argument in freshman calculus that we, this, will, this argument is, will immediately lead to uniqueness, right? Because here is this cartoon of it that uh, we are having this interpolation between t equal to zero and t equal to one. And as long as this curve is a strictly convex curve, then no matter how you draw it, we know that there will be at least one endpoint such that the energy is strictly going down to the first order of t at this endpoint. Right, so it means that um, the density corresponding to that endpoint cannot be a critical point. So that's a simple contradiction. But of course, the question is, how do we find such an interpolation curve, and if it exists at all? 
Um, so let me uh, review some literature about the convexity along an interpolation curve. Um, so, so far it is known for the following potentials. So first, um, if W is a convex function, then uh, it is well known, for example, for uh, one can refer to the book for uh, optimal. Uh, so this is derived by uh, McCann, and one can also see the, the optimal transport books by, by Villani, um, that uh, So if the interaction potential is convex, then for uh, along, um, so along, the, the inter along the geodesics, in the two Wasserstein metric that are connecting any two densities, um, the energy will be convex. Um, however, I want to emphasize that our W doesn't have this property um, because all the assumption we want to make is that W is the radially increasing potential, uh, which does, doesn't necessarily have to be convex. Um, so this is the convexity along the geodesics into Wasserstein metric. And on the other hand, that if W has the good sign in, on its Fourier side, um, then one can check that. Um, so the, the interaction energy can be seen as a nice integral on the Fourier side. And in this case, if one just simply take the linear interpolation between row zero and row one, then the energy would be convex. But again, that our assumption is the only assumption we want to make is W is a, is a radially increasing potential, which doesn't necessarily have the good sign on its Fourier side. So uh, the main idea of our proof is actually the construction of a novel interpolation curve between two radially decreasing density so that the interaction energy is um, convex along this curve. Uh, so uh, let me describe to you our construction of this interpolation curve. Um, to make things easier, instead of describing the most general case for any two radially decreasing functions, uh, let me give you a picture of how this is done for step functions. So for step functions, suppose we are trying to connect row zero and row one. Uh, both of them have mass one. And uh, let's say that they are both uh, step functions with n horizontal layer with mass one over n in each layer. So in this picture, we are showing, uh, I'm showing you a picture with two layers where the yellow one and the green one all have mass one half and one half. So to connect these two step functions, uh, this is the middle step here is the interpolation that we construct. Uh, namely that we want at each middle time to also have a step function with the mass one half and one half. And for the height of each step, we want it to be the linear interpolation between the left picture and the right picture. Um, so uh, right here. And um, so now the mass is fixed to be one half and the height is fixed to be the linear interpolation. So the width really doesn't have any choice, right? It has to automatically adjust each other itself um, to make the mass to be a constant. So that is the interpolation of the middle step. Uh, I want to point out that um, this is neither the linear interpolation nor the geodesics into Wasserstein metric. Um, so to our best knowledge, uh, we are unaware of uh, any previous literature using this weird kind of uh, interpolation. Um, but if it turns out that we are reinventing the wheels, um, please let us know and we will appreciate that. Okay, so um, this is the picture for two layers. And now for any radially decreasing function, uh, one can approximate it by a step function with infinitely many layers. And then, um, so then we can, this is actually how we construct the interpolation. So namely that uh, for any density row, uh, for, any, uh, for any given number s between zero and one, there is a unique height such that um, the mass under this horizontal line exactly have mass s, and that is what we call the height function. And um, so our final interpolation is that, um, so for these two functions, row zero and row one, uh, we let h zero and h one to be the height function. 
and uh, we will let the height function to be the linear interpolation between its two endpoints. And the density can be actually uniquely recovered from the, uh, the height function by um, a little bit involved formula here. Um, but at the end, this is, it's actually the same thing as the previous slides for the step function case. And now with this construction of the interpolation curve, our goal is to show that both the, um, the entropy part and the interaction energy part um, are convex along this uh, interpolation. So the entropy part actually result in, uh, it comes from a very explicit, just a few line long computation that uh, one can uh, represent this entropy using in terms of the height function and then to see that whether it is convex along the interpolation one can simply just take two time derivatives on t and then this is the so the end of the computation which is just a very short one and then one can see that the second time derivative is um, is m minus two times something that is always positive which means that, so here is where our m bigger than two constraint comes out. Um, so we have that the entropy is convex along this, um, this interpolation for m bigger than or equal to two, but concave the, the other way around. Um, so um, now um, as for the interaction energy, so this is the important part of the proof. Um, so we show that it is, uh, has this magical property that it is strictly convex along the interpolation curve. Um, and the condition that we need on W here is exactly what we have, that W is any radially increasing potential. This will be enough. Um, so the proof is a lot more technical than above, so I would rather to hide it from you. Uh, but let me just comment on that. Um, so for the one-dimensional proof, it's not too bad. And actually, the way that we found this interpolation curve is that we first tried it in the 1D case with only two blocks here. And then we see that, well, it seems like this interpolation works. And then it's rather simple to come up with a full proof of the 1D case. Uh, but it took us a few more months to prove the convexity in the multi-dimension case. But at the end of the day, this turns out the convexity is true. Um, so which, and the convexity, uh, which means that combining these two parts together, we immediately have the uniqueness for the M bigger than or equal to two case. Okay, so um, now uh, you may wonder that, well, clearly we see how that proof fails for M less than two, right? Because the entropy is not convex in that case. Uh, but this could be either due to our limitation of the proof, or it could be due to that there is really no uniqueness and which way, which case it is. Uh, in the same paper with Matthias and Shikai, uh, we show that, well, um, so in the M less than two case, in general, that we really cannot expect uniqueness. So namely that uh, we construct a smooth attractive potential that gives an infinite sequence of radially decreasing steady states, always the same mass. Um, we are able to do a slightly stronger results than this, namely that um, if you throw at us any potential that are, that are attractive, we are able to actually modify its tail into another attractive potential uh, that leads to an infinite number of steady states. So combining this with the uniqueness result, it means that uh, the m equal to 2 uh, for a general potential is indeed the threshold separating uniqueness versus non-uniqueness. Um, so our idea of the non-uniqueness proof is as follows that uh, let's say that we start with some very nice potential W where we know that it has leads to some steady states rho s for a given mass. So um, an important property for, uh, for the, because of the, uh, the, the power m, we are assuming it's bigger than one, uh, we are using the property that uh, all the steady states rho s are compactly supported. So it means that we are able to, uh, if we modify the potential w outside of the radius 2r, 
notice that uh, so for this steady state rho s, if it, if it has support in R, then all the particles only has distance at most two R from each other. Therefore, if we modify the potential outside the distance to R, then the particles will not feel anything, right? They will still happily sit there. So no matter how we modify it, we still have the same steady state. And our proof is based on the idea that if we modify the tail such that the slope outside 3R is a positive number that is tiny, then we claim that this will lead to a new steady state that is a lot flatter than rho s. So the reason for this is as follows. Uh, for a moment, let's assume that we set the slope k to be completely equal to zero so that we have a completely flat tail after the radius to 3r. Okay, so for such a potential that is completely flat outside a certain radius, uh, it actually is the same thing as an integrable kernel because, well, for interaction kernel, it doesn't matter if you shift it up and down, right? Therefore, if it's flat after a certain radius, you can shift it down so that it is completely equal to zero outside a certain radius. And then for an integrable attractive kernel, um, it is known that the following heuristic shows that there is a big difference between m less than two and m bigger than two. Namely that if we do the following scaling argument, that we start with a very, very flat initial condition and then see that um, to make this density, to scale it to be very flat and then see how these two parts of the, 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 the energy uh, change uh, with respect to the scaling, then each of them will have this power of lambda popping out and then if we are comparing their power, we notice that the two powers are exactly matching each other at m equal to two. Um, so when m is less than two, one can check that uh, it is energy favorable uh, for a very flat initial data to become even flatter. But if m is bigger than two, then it's energy favorable for a flat initial data to contract a little bit. So this is like heuristically, what's the difference between between m less than two and m bigger than two for an integrable kernel. Okay, so now uh, for our rigorous proof, the idea is that, uh, well, um, so we want to choose this slope k uh, to be something that is not quite equal to zero, but very small. And in this case, uh, we will show that, well, a flat uh, initial data will still remain very flat so here um, our argument is actually a rather standard energy estimate that rho s is the steady state so we are tracking this lp norms how it evolves and then we show that on the one hand that if m is less than two and if k is very small then any flat initial data will remain very flat so it will never convert to this black the, the blue curve but on the other hand that due to we are choosing um, a, a non-zero, a positive k, um, the interaction potential is growing linearly at large distance. Therefore, this will give us that the particle can't get too far away because they cannot afford that kind of energy. So we will have some kind of uniform tightness of the solution. And then we run a rather standard argument saying that a uniform in time LP bound plus a uniform in time tightness plus that we are having the energies non-increasing, these three components will give us that um, uh, in some along some diverging sequence of time, the solution will converge to a new steady state, which has to be flatter than the steady state we have because the red curve can never approach the blue curve. So this is how we get one single extra steady state. And then we can simply run an iterative argument by mod modifying the tail to be further and further so that we get an infinite sequence of steady state. So this is how we get non-uniqueness for the m between one and two k's. Um, so uh, at the end, let me just point out two open questions that we are not able to solve. Um, the first question is that, well, um, so now we get uniqueness for m bigger than 2, non-uniqueness for m between 1 and 2, 
However, in the very important case of linear diffusion m equal to one uh, for a general attractive potential, we still don't know whether there is uniqueness or not. Um, the reason is that um, our non-uniqueness proof is heavily based on the idea that the steady states are compactly supported, so we can modify the tail without them feeling anything. Um, but um, but for m equal to one, due to the linear diffusion and the infinite speed of propagation, all the steady states are supported in the whole, whole plane, which means that um, we, we are not able to modify the tail with the steady states remain unchanged. So that's a difficulty. Um, and another question is that, um, recall that our eventual goal is to understand the long time behavior of the dynamical solution. But so far that I'm only discussing the results for steady states. Um, so to get to the, so let's say we are in the good case where we have uniqueness of steady state one would formally expect that it should be the global attractor. Um, however, that um, in order to prove that, the difficulty is that we need to have some kind of tightness of the solution and we need to rule out the mass cannot escape to infinity. Uh, if the interaction potential is growing to infinity, then this is easy to show. But if it has some decay as x goes to infinity, then we don't know how to obtain any tightness results. Um, so I want to point out um, there are some recent progress in this direction by Reuben Shu, who is the bright um, young researcher at the University of Maryland. And he gets some recent progress on the tightness question in 1D and 2D um, for the potentials that are allowed to decay at infinity uh, for, uh, for the large diffusion power M. So that's all I want to talk about. And thank you for your attention.